There we go. Is it on? It came yeah. and then yeah. I hear you. Yeah, here you are. Yeah, I think you can start it just. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you, even though we're not together, we are together in a way. Um, King Cobras have always been an obsession with me, along with all the other snakes in the world. And uh, in this case, uh, I've been very lucky to have been brought up in India and actually spent my schooling days in the Western Ghats where King Cobras are found. And uh, the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, which I set up in 2005, was really this sort of moment at which I became very serious about looking at king cobras and their behavior. Can you see the next one? And uh, that is when we got together. Next slide, please. Okay, I put this India state map in for some of our friends, international friends who may be slightly geographically uh, disoriented about India, but the next slide shows you the range of the king cobra in India. Next one, please. Okay, um, king cobras are found in the Western Ghats, of course, in the Eastern Ghats, in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, and then starting in Odisha all the way up into the Northeast and then across the Himalayas, virtually all the way to Himachal Pradesh. And uh, they, are, they do enter into Goa, and there is a chance that they have been recorded in the southern tip of Maharashtra as well. Okay, it's um, a snake which I would always, when I see the snake, to me, it's an innocent snake. To other people, it's a very deadly and the largest venomous snake. It has all this big sort of hype about how huge and how dangerous it is. Indeed, it has a large quantity of venom in its venom glands, but indeed also it's a very nervous snake as far as humans are concerned, and it rightly keeps out of people's way. And it's just that it, and being a large snake, luckily it can be easily avoided, and luckily it is not, it is not nocturnal, it's mainly diurnal, it's around in the daytime, so you don't have instances of people stepping on them at night. So it causes very few bites, that's very fortunate for India because we don't have an antivenom for King Cobra bite. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Okay, the Danish naturalist Peter Cantor described the King Cobra way back in 1836. It's not really so way back when you consider such a large and very obvious snake was only described rather recently compared to so many of the other species of snakes. And it was originally called, in, put in the same genus as the cobra, Naja, or Naya, and has then been changed to Ophiophagus. And the name Ophiophagus means it's a snake eater. And indeed, it does feed primarily on snakes, although it does take monitor lizards as well. The second image, next image, is uh, a drawing which was done by an artist in West Bengal way back in 1830s when uh, Dr. Cantor described the snake first. Next one, please. The next image shows you a picture of the mangrove swamps in the Sundarbans in West Bengal, where the king cobra was first found and first described. And it also, it, in a way, it's very interesting because it shows the different habitats that they're found in. And they're found in the Western Ghats, the deep rainforests, as well as in the mangrove swamps of the Sundarbans and the mangrove swamps in Odisha in the Belkanika. Next one, please. Okay, in the Western Ghats, this is a very typical snake during the breeding season. This is a male king cobra. And the reason why I say typical during the breeding season is because they actually change color and become lighter in the breeding season, the mature adult male king cobras. Next one, please. This is a female king cobra in the breeding season, and she is much darker and uh, with very contrasting bands. And 
we think that this is very important for her to be able to identify herself to a male king cobra who might be a hungry fellow. And since they are cannibalistic, it's very important for the female king cobra to show that she's not a food item, but rather a, an item that can, who can be mated with. Next one, please. And the color and banding differ dramatically in different parts of India, which kind of indicates just visually that we're looking very likely at different species, but that's another whole discussion. We'll talk about that a bit later. But let's see the next one. This is a typical dark male Western Ghats king cobra in the non-breeding season. You saw the first one that I showed you was a very light color during the breeding season. This is in the non-breeding season, the Western Ghats King Cobra is very dark with yellowish and whitish bands. Next one. Next, please. Yeah. And here, very, very different is a King Cobra uh, the, the, it, from the Lower Himalayas. This was in Corbett National Park. This is an adult male. Very, very different from the ones in the Western Ghats. And the next one you will see from the Andaman Islands is again quite different. The number of bands, the width of the bands and the coloration, very different indeed. And it is very likely we are looking at different species of King Cobras here. The next one. This one, again, different kinds of bands, different shape of bands and different coloration. This is a typical King Cobra from the mangroves of East Coast of Odisha in actually the Bitar Kanaka area, the mangrove swamps. Next one. And again, one from the Sundabans. And you saw the original painting, which was done back in Cantor's time, very, very similar to this one found on the mud flats in the Sundabans. Next one, please. Okay, uh, there's a couple of shots these two or three shots of the forests in the Western Ghats. Many of you have visited the Western Ghats and know the forest indeed, but let me just show you the next one, please. It uh, indicates the diversity of flora. The vegetation there is incredibly diverse. It's a, a very wet landscape in most parts of the Western Ghats, which is ideal for king cobras and their prey. Next one, please. and plenty of water, plenty of streams. I think the remarkable thing about the streams in the forests are that even when the water is rushing at the beginning of the monsoon, they're not muddy streams. They're always clear and clear and beautiful uh, water during the, even during the heavy rains. Next. And this was taken just behind the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station in the stream bed below where we have a, a field station. You can see what a fantastic location this is. Next one, please. Okay, just to point out where the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station is, the uh, arrow points right to it. You can see how far it is. away from Bangalore. It's very close to Mangalore, actually, on the west coast, just inland from Mangalore, where the Western Ghats begin. And the next one, please. And the various statistics, it has as much as seven to eight mil um, meters of rain every year. The elevation of Agumbe is not very high, it's 680 meters, and the habitat is variable evergreen forest primarily, but there are plenty of rice paddies and various areconaut and other tree plantations there. Next one. Okay, a view of part of the Agumbe rainforest area. Uh, to the left is an area called the Someshwara National Park, uh, wildlife sanctuary, pardon me. And this is also very close and almost adjacent to the Kudamuk National Park. I think there's a photograph of that coming up. Next one, please. Okay, it is naturally, I mean, the Western Ghats in general is a diversity hotspot. 
and many new species are being described, uh, discovered and described there as we speak, mostly amphibians right now. Next. Um, this, uh, these figures are way out of date. For example, the amphibians, I've only put 180, but they're well over 250 now, having been described. And uh, mammals, 135 plus. Reptiles, 225 plus. Birds, 500 plus. Butterflies, again, many more species are being described and many more, particularly insects, have to be described. And at the bottom, uh, you can't see it probably very clearly, but leeches are a definite, uh, I wouldn't say problem, but an ever-present uh, <laughs> complication, you could say. Okay. Some of the other reptiles in the King Cobra's realm in these Western Ghats are, and let's have a look at them. The Russell's Viper, this is a very different color phase, a very different and very interesting color phase found in the uh, Mangalore area and inland from Mangalore, where you can hardly see any of the typical markings of the Russell's Viper, and it's got this very reddish color. Interestingly, it lived, it, this particular snake was found very uh, amongst laterite rock, which is reddish itself. So there's definitely a correlation there. Next one. And this beautiful forest lizard, one of the most multicolored lizards that we have in India. Next one, please. The flying lizard, or Draco, uh, which is very common, particularly in Arecanut plantations, they love it and uh, one of my favorite reptiles. The cane turtle, which was uh, rediscovered by a young lady herpetologist named Vijaya, and it was renamed Vijaya Kelly's in her honor um, in recent years. Next one. Brooks forest lizard, a very common species of a gamut found again in, very easy to see in Arikanet plantations. And here's a mating pair of Malabar pit vipers. You can see the male is absolutely minuscule compared to the female. And this is an interesting dimorphism, which is very common among many species of snakes, where the male is much smaller than the female. Next one is a, this is a large scale shield tail. There are several species of shield tail snakes uh, in the Gumbi area and throughout the Western Ghats. And several more have recently been described. And I think important from the human standpoint are that these waters are the source for half a billion people. The rivers that emerge from the Western Ghats, uh, the mouth, uh, the uh, head of the Calvary River, for example, in the Western Ghats in Kug, uh, serve how many millions of people? So this is how important the Western Ghats are, even though we've lost nearly 80% of the forest there already. Next one. Yeah, seven to 8,000 millimeters of uh, rain a year there. Uh, it is really wet. It's very hard to dry your clothes out, let me tell you. And uh, one year we got 11,000 millimeters of rain. Uh, that rivals Chirapunji, I'm sure. Next one, please. Yeah, just a couple of scenic shots of the waterfalls and streams that are throughout the area there. Next one. Very good habitats for pit vipers along the edges of these streams. And walking along the, I mean, the streams themselves create very easy access into the forest. Okay, we set up this uh, research base in 2005. My mother actually provided, when she died, she left us uh, a legacy of money, enough to buy uh, 10 acres of land within the forest there. And luckily we found an old farmhouse, which. Uh, an elderly couple was very eager to get out of there and said, please buy our land. And we were certainly very happy to take it over. And that's when, that's where the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station started. Next one, please. It's been uh, very successful. Uh, during the monsoon, you can see that the whole place becomes completely shot, overshadowed with fog. And uh, there is no glimpse of sunlight sometimes for a month or two at a time. Next one. 
We've set up uh, several cottages for people to stay. I mean, working in the rainforest is exciting, but it is a little bit tiring too. And uh, unless you have a comfortable place, you can come back to in the evening and rest and have a good meal and a, a nice night's sleep. It's pretty difficult working, I can tell you. Next one. So various aspects of research have been done. We've uh, attracted researchers from all over India and all over the world, really, to come there and carry out different kinds of research and filming activities. Next one, please. And the biodiversity there is fantastic, as you can imagine. And we're doing stuff uh, up in the canopy as well. And uh, we're putting out camera traps and finding out some very, very interesting creatures. In fact, there's a black leopard who's using our area as his home range. And he appears on the camera trap quite often these days. Next one. There is uh, incredible diversity of amphibians in particular. More and more species are being described as we speak. Next one. Kudamuk Tiger Reserve is very close to Agombe. And uh, this is typical grasslands and shola forests of this kind of habitat, and uh, complete with tigers. Okay, we get uh, king cobra calls from farmers and villages almost every day. And I'm just going to go through a couple of shots uh, showing you that there is a safe and sane way to rescue king cobras. For example, just have a look at this. This one fell into a well, quite a deep well. It's a dry well. And to get him out was pretty difficult, but it was done very carefully. It was, let's say, a safe and gentle way of getting the king cobra around. Next. This was a very interesting king cobra who was shedding his skin, uh, shedding her skin. It was a female. And uh, she actually stayed in the bathroom for several days. And uh, the... I asked the people, why didn't you call me earlier? And they said, well, it wasn't hurting us, and we can always use some other bathroom. <laughs> so they were very patient in letting it stay there for that length of time. Next. And uh, in this case, the king cobra was seeking warmth and ended up in the, underneath the hood of a car. Luckily, they checked it before they were driving off that day because it could have been some serious repercussions. Next one. And in this case, again, very lucky, they did see the king cobra up under the dashboard of this truck. And uh, to get it out was quite a hassle, as you can imagine. Next one. And here's Ajay Giri finding a king cobra in the roof of a house and bagging it with everyone looking on. The reason king cobras come to people's houses is searching for snakes because there are very often rats in houses, and very often cobras and rat snakes come to people's houses. And the king cobra, with its incredible sense of smell, using its tongue, will search and find the snake that is going to be its next meal. So finding it up on the roof is a little complicated, of course. But king cobra rescue should be relaxed and cool. None of the crazy stuff that you see on some of the Facebook postings you see nowadays of people grabbing it by the neck. I got to admit, Ajay is one of the most careful king cobra handlers, and I think we have a short video to show you at the end of this to give an idea of exactly how, he's, how he does it. Next one. And the release of the king cobra is incredibly important to release him close by within the king cobra's home range. This is not very easy sometimes because when you catch a king cobra near or in someone's house, they say, please take it far away. And you say, of course, of course. And usually the, the idea is that you, you explain to them, look, this is the first time you've seen this king crow, but he's in, this is his home range, and he's not hurting anybody. And chances are he's going to be eating up all the cobras and vipers around here anyway. So this is a good educational spiel that Ajay will give at the end of every capture. Next one. But there's a stupid and dangerous way to rescue king cobra too. I'll just check this one out. Now, this guy uh, is very lucky to be alive, and uh, he is disrespectful to the snake, and the snake is 
and is fortunately very, let's say, condescending or very easygoing and is not trying to kill him. Next one. And this shows a rather famous fellow down in Kerala who does the same thing. And uh, I, I just have to say that uh, this is one of the most ridiculous types of performances one can do. And it just shows that the snake is not interested in biting. He only wants to get away. And more insanity. Yeah, you see a lot of this stuff on Facebook these days. And uh, try as we, we we're trying very hard to convince people that yes, snakes do have to be rescued, but do respect the snakes. And usually, when we ask snake rescuers, "So do you like snakes?" and they say, "Yes, we like snakes." Okay then respect them, treat them carefully. And here's a guy to, who grabs the king cobra by the neck. He's endangering himself, his own life, and he's definitely endangering the snake. He could easily injure the snake by grabbing it and holding it, squeezing it like this. Next one. And the same with this guy, grabbing it by the neck, making a hero pose for a photograph. This is very dangerous to the snake and very dangerous to the catcher. And there is absolutely no need to do this. So the re rescue and relocation is definitely sometimes necessary, but it can be done safely. And I think it's pretty clear how it can be done safely. Uh, and these are rescuers who were actually killed by king cobras in a couple of years ago. Prufflebutt, not far away from Agumbe, uh, a couple of years ago, Kamal, in in Nepal, who was drunk when he had this king cobra around his neck. And a friend of ours uh, in Bali, whom we tried very hard to convince not to catch king cobras by neck, grabbing him by the neck. He did, he got bitten, and there were no antivenom for any of these cases, and they all died. Totally useless waste of life. And the Gumbek king cobras are respected and revered, which is really wonderful. Uh, you can actually see a grin on the faces of these ladies who are looking at the king cobra, and partly due to our um, educational efforts in Agumbe, people are very easy going about it. But elsewhere in India, these snakes face big problems. For example, in Andhra Pradesh, in the eastern Ghats where king cobras are found, they're usually killed on sight. Luckily, a friend of ours named Murti has started a project over there. He's with the Eastern Gods Wildlife Society. And he has, uh, they have now have a small video showing how the people of Agumbe are get along with King Cobras. And it's been dubbed in Telugu. And people in Andhra Pradesh are now calling up for the rescue of the King Cobra rather than killing it. Next one. Unfortunately, in the Northeast, things are a little bit different. These pictures were all taken in Mizoram in recent years, and people uh, have a tendency to kill king cobras on site. So there's still a lot of work to do and a, a lot of education to go on to happen. Next one. And the main thing is education. It is really a priority. A rescue is a perfect time for education. And um, you can see that Ajay has just caught a king cobra. It's in a bag right in the center there. The people are all standing around listening to him, telling them exactly why the king cobra has come near a house, probably to find a snake, if they're not interested in hurting people, and that if they see a human being, they'll get the heck out of there fast. They're very respectful of humans, quite rightfully so. Yeah, so we made various pamphlets, in this case in Canada, but... Uh, pamphlets in the various regional languages are extremely important to tell people the basic facts about King Cobras and a lot, goes really well along with the educational work that uh, is being done by people like uh, Ajun. Next one. And these education programs have told us, have uh, gotten a lot of information for us. For example, the lady who's right in, in front of me uh, standing there actually found this pile of leaves and decided she'd collect it to put in her cow shed. And when she put her arms around the leaves, she heard this loud sound from the inside and she got scared and called us up. And sure enough, there was a female king cobra and it was a king cobra man. So it works. Next one. 
Okay, the king cobra is the only snake out of 3,000 odd species in the world that actually makes a nest. This is really amazing. She piles up this massive pile of leaves. It takes her a week or two, or maybe even three weeks, to make this incubation chamber for her eggs, to keep the eggs dry from torrential rains and perfect temperature for incubation. Next one. For, uh, the snake actually has to cover the eggs with the leaves and uh, then she'll sit on the nest. Next one. And if any other, if a predator comes nearby, she'll protect them. So covering the eggs, they have to incubate there for a couple of months. And uh, in the Western Ghats, uh, the king cobra usually makes the nest, and then within a week or two, she actually leaves, she deserts the nest. A very, very different behavior in other parts, like in the Northeast India. The next one, please. In, in Northeast India and in the Andaman Islands and in Thailand, the king cobra female stays on her nest for the entire incubation, all the way to the end, till the babies hatch. And this is obviously a good deterrent for predators because any predator who comes and sees a big snake like this lying on the top of a pile of leaves is not going to mess around, not going to mess with it, I should say. Next one. Yeah, next one, please. In uh, Agombe, we have uh, been able to uh, get some, this uh, Kirti is a zoology student and right near her house, not even 50 yards away from her house, a king cobra made a nest. Her parents weren't too happy about the whole idea, but we asked her if she would check the temperatures of the nest over the period, during the period of incubation. And we promised her parents that we would take the babies and release them away from the house. So they were quite okay with her doing this. And this was exciting for her too, of course. Yeah, the eggs are leathery, they're longish, and uh, the incubation temperature is anywhere from 22 degrees to 32 degrees, centi 32 degrees centigrade, depending on, of course, the outside temperature. And the nest does incubate them, uh, help to, the, the, the pile of leaves helps to incubate them. The babies hatch anywhere from 70 days in a higher temperature nest to all the way to over 100 days. We had a nest in Kudermuk, which was at a higher altitude, nearly 1,700 meters. And uh, there the nest it was quite cool. So it took 113 days for the babies to find the hatch. But it was 100% hatching. All of them hatched. And when the babies hatch, if it's uh, near somebody's house, we usually put a plastic sheet around the nest so the babies don't escape. People are not too happy about the idea of 20 or 30 babies or king cobras around their house. So we take them a bit of a distance away into the forest and release them. Naturally, the mortality is very high in baby snakes, just like in any baby reptile. So very few of them survive. A lot of predators, even with attitude like this. Uh, a mongoose, uh, an eagle, an owl, uh, uh, even uh, wild cats, civet cats, and wild boar, and monitor lizards. They've got many animals. Other snakes, of course, too. Next one. All right, male combat is a, a very interesting part of snake uh, behavior, which uh, many species take part in doing this. And uh, this is a, a, a dominance thing. Uh, it's usually related to mating. Usually, uh, we found that if we, if we have made up the observations, there'll be a female fairly close by where this combat is going on. The combat is not a serious sort of uh, life-threatening type of combat. It's really a wrestling match, and people are often referred to it as a combat dance and, uh, or a ritual combat. And it's basically can go on for uh, even an hour, sometimes even two hours, and they really get exhausted. But one does seem to come out the winner, and he's probably the one who's going to be mating with the female who may be nearby.
the interesting thing is that uh, since we're doing radio telemetry at uh, Agombe, which we'll talk about in a minute, we get to follow the male king cobras during the breeding season, which is just on and just ending now, actually. And uh, we get to see male combat quite frequently. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about telemetry. Radio telemetry is an incredible uh, opportunity to, to actually look into the secret life of snakes because you catch a king cobra, you release it, and then what happens? We have no idea. It just disappears and we don't see it again. So in 2008, we started King Cobra Telemetry. And the first thing you got to do, of course, is bag your King Cobra. That's Jerry Martin, one of our friends and colleagues, an expert snake handler. And he's just bagging the King Cobra. Next one. Getting it into the bag. It's incredibly important, obviously. It has to be done very carefully. And using an airtight container to anesthetize it, using an, uh, a, a, a gas which can anesthetize the snake, put it to sleep safely. And right here uh, in, the, in the background is Anirudh Balsare, a veterinarian. And in the center is Matt Good, who's a telemetry expert. And uh, the state, New uh, Mexico State herpetologist Charlie Painter in the foreground. This was the first king cobra, a three meter long male that we put a radio into. So the snake goes under, he's now anesthetized, and the first implant, the implant begins. And Matt is taking the, doing the surgery in this case. The radio is about the size of your thumb, and it uh, weighs about 25 grams. And uh, it has a range of anywhere from 500 meters to, uh, to almost a kilometer in some cases. And it will have a life of about two years. So the battery life is about two years. So you can actually follow the snake. This is in inserted in the salomic cavity. It's in the, inside the body cavity. And uh, it has a long antenna inside, which will beep the signal. Next one. Uh, along with the uh, transmitter, we also in insert eye buttons to log the temperature. And this is a very important part of learning about the King Cobra's behavior, finding out what temperatures they, uh, what, they, what they're what they doing, what their behavior is like, at what temperatures. This is an, a close-up image of uh, showing you the tiny eye button, which also goes into the snake. Okay, the snake is now under, but... Uh, you have to actually intubate it uh, by giving it so-called kiss of life. Next one. And in this case, Matt is giving it. You actually insert a straw into the glottis of the snake, hold it very carefully because you don't know how fast he might recover, and blow fresh air inside, and then uh, squeeze the gas out of his lungs so that he becomes normal and back to back into a healthy, alert condition. Again. Okay, and then getting the people out there to track the snake is the difficult part of it. We've worked out a system which works very well. We have volunteers who are come there. Usually there are biology students and other students who are, are interested in doing this as a, a very, very unique opportunity to study snakes. And the local tracker sitting there is the guy who is the key man because he knows the forest and knows how his way through the forest because the snake could go in any direction, and he has to be found. You have to keep with him. So it's very important to have a local tracker. Next one. All right. Uh, wonderful thing about Google Maps is that you can uh, locate uh, the snake wherever he's gone and uh, track it completely through the landscape. And you can see here the diversity of the landscape. There's forest all on the left here, but on the right, it's a very, very diverse, human-dominated landscape. Next one, please. Now, in this case, M1 was an experiment. He was actually translocated 40 kilometers. I told you earlier that it's very important not to translocate a, a, a snake 
In fact, any animal, when it's being relocated, it should be re relocated as close to its home range as possible. But we had a very important uh, thing to prove here, that translocating a king cobra is not a good thing for it. And uh, David, if I can request you to put the short video clip on. Yes, now just check this out very carefully, please. And you'll see the movement of this snake. I'm not sure if it's clear enough for you to see it, but uh, the data is on the right hand side. Uh, M1 moved in all sorts of crazy directions because he couldn't find his way home, basically. And he moved almost, well, close to 100 kilometers. But you can imagine a snake moving 100 kilometers. This is in itself quite an incredible thing. M2, on the other hand, was caught, and ever since then we've uh, caught and released him in the same place. So this is M2. And you'll notice that he doesn't go off in some terrible direction. He usually stays in one very, very compact circular direction. Even though he travels many, many kilometers over a period of a year, his home range is very, very small. And he knows exactly where he's going. In this case, it's, uh, I, I believe, only 15 square kilometers, which is pretty big for a snake. But uh, in fact, it's a very, very circular pattern. And the snakes seem to know exactly what they're doing, where they're going, where they can find food, where they can find water, where they can hide. And you notice that he's been crossing the road quite a bit there too, which is a bit scary for us because every time he crosses the road, we're saying, oh my God, I hope he doesn't get run over. So this is his entire home range. He didn't go off in some terrible direction the way in one day. This is the home range of a king cobra. And this was a real eye opener for us. Okay, and M2's home range is very clearly shown on this map, very circular pattern. And this is the place he knows best. Next one. Okay, he was uh, in the monsoon months, he was in the forest and in the summer he came out to the fields. In the fields, he was finding common cobras and rat snakes. And in the forest, in the monsoon, he was finding pit bikers. M4 was a, another uh, king cobra who had a larger home range of 30 square kilometers. And look at the landscape that he went through. There was hardly any forest, actually, that he lived in. He lived mostly in people's rice fields and in people's farms and backyards. So plenty of rat snakes, obviously, and plenty of cobras, too. So he was, he was doing okay, as long as he was... As long as the people were okay with him, he was doing fine. Next one. So the king cobras seem to have an olfactory and or a visual map of their home range. And the, the proof of the pudding here is that translocation is not good for king cobras. That M1 just didn't know where the hell to go and where to find a place to rest. Okay, we've published quite a bit of these findings. And in 1996, uh, Indunil Das and I did a bibliography, but it needs a lot of updating. The next slide shows you a few of the publications that we've come out with uh, in recent years, and more are, are coming out as we speak because we're now tracking three king cobras in Agumbe. So this has been an incredible exercise. We never really knew very much about king cobras until now. And uh, a similar project and a similar study is going on in Thailand, in northern Thailand, and a lot of very interesting and wonderful data is coming out from there as well. Next one. Okay, a lot of secrets are emerging, as I said. Some are not so pretty. And courtship, in, in, for one thing, was usually gentle and very persistent. The male would butt the female, coming closer to her, coming over her, the female putting on this display. Next one, please. Uh, the female basically trying to make sure that the male knows that she's not a food item, that she's, uh, she's for mating, not for, for eating. And uh, she will make this submissive display. But things can go terribly wrong. And in this case, uh, a female, the male actually bit and killed uh, a 
a female who had already was already gravid. She already had eggs. And you can actually see the swelling of her body where the eggs are. And we found this uh, since then, this was back in 2010 or 2011, we found, uh, we've observed this three or four times now that uh, males have killed females. We're not really quite sure how this works. This is not evolutionary very wise, but we do know that cannibalism is very common in many snake species. Here's a common spectacle cobra grabbing another spectacle cobra to kill it and eat it. And we'll see several more. So here's a vine snake swallowing a, a, fly, a flying snake, again, in a gumbe. And the next one. Here's a banded crate swallowing a Russell's viper up in northeast India. Next one. And a cobra swallowing a Russell's viper. So snakes eating snakes is pretty common. It's not unusual at all. And here's a coral snake eating a Europeltid, one of the shield-tailed snakes. Next one. Cobras are definitely on the king cobra's menu. And despite the cobra spreading his hood and putting on a good show, he hasn't got a chance. Next one, please. Once a king cobra has started following the scent or the track of another snake, that snake has had it. This snake, this cobra is, again, trying to put on a show, trying to be brave, but he hasn't got a chance. Next one. And here's a case of a king cobra which actually grabs the uh, uh, spectacle cobra in the water, grabs it by the head, and kills it. The Asian rat snake, the common rat snake, is actually uh, probably, you know, next slide, shows you a, a rat snake being swallowed by a king cobra. And they probably form a major part of the king cobra's diet, especially the king cobras who spend their time in and around rice fields and people's houses. Because as you know, rat snakes are one of the most common snakes and common large snakes in India. And the king cobra wants a good big meal, not just a tiny meal. And we've seen um, rat snakes retaliate, including giving the king cobra a bad bite. And it looks like it's bad on its eyes. But uh, in this case, it, it didn't harm the snake at all. They've got a good covering over the eye. So the teeth didn't penetrate. And here is a king cobra eating my namesake, a Whitaker's boy. But this is just a snack. This is like a vade or an idli or something for a king cobra. It's not really a, a solid meal the way a rat snake. Interestingly, uh, the only other creature a king cobra will normally eat is a monitor lizard. And this kind of tells you how closely related monitors are to snakes with their forked tongues, with their Jacobson's organs. They obviously have the right smell, even if they don't have the right shape of the snake. They've got legs, which is a little bit difficult to get down, I'm sure. But uh, as far as the king cobra is concerned, it's a snake with legs. In this case, a friend of ours took a picture of a king cobra which was killed after swallowing a, a water monitor lizard. Next one. But kings will eat rats. You gotta fool them. This, this I'm just hamming this up with a, a sort of a chef's uh, outfit. We were doing it for a little film, which we never even used in the film. But we found a roadkill dead snake, and we made a soup out of it, and dipped the wraps into a soup, and held it out to the king cobra. And the king cobra looked at it very dubiously. That doesn't look like a snake, but it sure smells like a snake. You could almost see its mind working, and it grabbed it out of my. I had it on the, on the tongs, and I grabbed it from the tongs and swallowed it. So we started feeding it rats, which is very useful for having king, captive king cobras. Otherwise, you have to keep catching snakes to feed them all the time. Rats are much easier to get. Yeah, next one. Okay, that brings us to an end. And uh, there was just um, a, a few pictures of king cobras after this. And we'll see the last slide. Just to give you an idea of some of the portraits of King Cobras, all very in, from very different parts of the country and therefore very different coloration and pattern. And I really thanks, thanks to you all very much.
for listening to me go on about King Kovas. I, I could go on for another couple of hours, I guess you can understand. But I do welcome you to try to come and visit Agombe when things get a little bit more normalized in this strange world of ours right now. The Agombe Rainforest Research Station has accommodation for people to come and stay. And it's very rare that you get to see a King Cobra in the wild, but if you come there, the chances are almost 100%. Now, besides Agumbe, we've uh, made several films. For My wife, Janaki Lennon, and I made a film on King Cobras way back in 1996 for National Geographic. And uh, since then, uh, I've been involved in the making of three more King Cobra films. And so there are quite a few, uh, let's say, opportunities of bringing King Cobras into your living room via television. But if you want to see one in the wild, Come and visit us. Be in touch with us. Thanks very much.